Hi, everyone. Today I am joined by scientist, astrophysicist Garik Israelian. He is also the co founder of STARMIS, a global science festival which will be taking place in Armenia this September. We will talk more about that shortly. Okay, your background is way cooler than mine. <laughs> Hi, Garik John. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you so much, and thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Okay, I have to tell you, it's kind of funny the way I learned about you, given the close connection that we actually have. Because, mm -hmm. so I was doing research on Larry King as I was getting ready to interview him. I was doing research and I was going through all of his interviews and I saw he had an interview with Stephen Hawking and to my surprise, an Armenian astrophysicist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. So I sent the episode to my mom and I said, mom, have you heard of this guy? This is so cool. And she goes, oh, that's my childhood friend, Gadik. <laughs> and so of course I had to tell her to connect us and I've been wanting to do this for probably a couple of years now. So thank you so much for making the time to do it today. Pleasure, so much, I'm pleasure. Gadik, there are a couple of areas that I like to focus on on this show. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is how the guest was able to become so successful and what the initial steps were that they took to become successful. But the second part of it is um, how the guest has used their accomplishments to put Armenia in international headlines and how they have kind of strategically helped to put Armenia on the map. Now, you were born in Armenia, you got your education in Armenia you became one of the most important scientists in the world. And now you are bringing the biggest science festival with some of the most brilliant minds to Armenia. How did you come up with this concept? Well, I think the concept uh, is, uh, is basically partially is my life story because Starmus is about inspiration. It's about inspiring people, inspiring students, kids. And we were inspired. I was very inspired by, by sci-fi, by music when I was a kid. In fact, I was not a brilliant <laughs> student at all. And uh, I don't remember if I was interested in maths or science or physics at school, not at all. I was more interested in music, especially rock music. It was my, you know, 70s. We grew up with hard rock. We grew up with the Beatles and, and then following with, with the top bands. And so my dream was, I didn't have a dream even. I mean, I was with guitar and with music every day. That was my life. Yeah. And suddenly... And that happened after school, actually, because I finished the school and I still didn't know what to do. I had no idea. I didn't go to university first year. So I finished the school and I went to work in the theater. And um, yeah, the theater. I was carrying decorations and I was just <laughs> as a worker. <laughs> and then one day I saw a sci-fi film and I was so inspired. It's a sci-fi, actually. Uh, that, that I think I have to blame sci-fi for bringing me to science and for inspiring me. And then thanks to this film, I was reading day and night, 24 seven sci-fi books, everything from all classic, from Isaac Asimov, from Robert Heinlein, Sheckley and blah, everything. So I just went in a in, in couple of months and that took me to, to science, to astronomy. And then, then I decided, okay, I want to study more. I want to know more about space. I want to learn more about nature. I'm curious about nature. I, I want to know how the quark works. I, don't, I, I want to know everything about nature, right? So that was, the, that was the inspiration I got. And plus there was this music and I was growing up with more progressive music because we started with very simple hard rock. Then growing up, I discovered more progressive music and then to jazz and to jazz rock. And then so I mean, my music was also getting more and more complicated and, and interesting. The whole spectrum, the world was opening for me from musical perspectives to science to everything. So then I discovered that, okay, the world is much more than I knew when I was a kid. 
And so then I went to university. I was a very good. I was one of the best students at the university in physics, in fact. But without making much efforts, I don't remember attending lectures. I never actually attended lectures. I used to study with books. I had a brilliant collection of the best books of physics because they were so cheap in Soviet Union. I could buy them, just go to the shop and buy all the books I need. So I was buying, I had a massive library of physics and maths and everything. So at home, I was just reading these books. I was studying for me, not even for university. I didn't care about exams and lectures and all that stuff. So I was just reading to satisfy my curiosity. That was the bottom line. And I was not interested what are what is the program, the, what is the university program? I was studying things which we never studied at the university, just for, my, for me, for my curiosity. So I have plenty of time and the rest of the, uh, and then I was also playing in a rock band with friends at the university. We had a band, uh, hiking, partying. There was so much parties. So just, oh my God. So all my <laughs> time. <laughs> good. So it was a brilliant, brilliant time for me for studying, for enjoying uh, with music, with everything, with friends. So, and then uh, it was, yeah, I think I was so lucky to do what I wanted to do. I was, yeah. But at and, what point did that passion turn into a career? What was that first step? I never realized this, this point that the passion is becoming a career. I think that's the, probably if you call it a success, maybe the success comes because I was always passionate. And I never realized that I'm doing my career. So I was so interested in what I was doing, even for my PhD. I, 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 I was the one to select, a, to choose a topic of my research and to dig inside and to look for something interesting and try to explain something. So I never felt this, you know, pressure from from my supervisors or whatever. And, and uh, so, so I was, it was all very creative. And even after my PhD, when I, and I went, uh, I left Armenia as a postdoc to do my postdoctoral research in Holland, in the Netherlands. And that was a very tough environment. I was very surprised actually. I, I, I find myself, it was a very competitive institute. So people, everyone were competing competing, competing for publishing more papers and going to conferences and so on. And I was quite shocked. I didn't know the scientific environment can be so competitive. I always thought that, Jesus, that's an art. It's, it's like you have to enjoy and then you have to. But I discovered, I mean, so my colleagues were really in a rush that we have to do this and we have to compete for contracts to get funding and so on. And I, and I never joined this competition, actually. I was so happy that I never joined this. And I was always observing this from the side, saying, Jesus Christ, and why, why you should do this? I mean, just, if, just do your work if you are interested. And if you are not, don't do it. But since I was interested in my profession, in my work, so I was just doing very well. I was publishing papers even alone. I had publication when, without any co-authors. So just myself, which was quite, with those days, I'm talking about late 90s, like 25 years ago. It was quite extraordinary for, for an astronomer or a scientist to publish a paper alone without any collaborators. And I was doing that. <laughs> so it was, I was, you know, it was my life. I was interested in something and I was doing it and I was finishing a paper. I was happy with the paper. And my colleagues were really looking at me like, I mean, who is this guy? I mean, <laughs> what, what <are> you? <laughs> that's really interesting because it was kind of a topic of conversation, especially during the pandemic and after, uh, when sometimes there could be conflicts of interest with scientists and um, and 
some of what ends up getting published because of what's being funded and what's not. So did you ever find that to be a point of frustration with funding or, or was that not an issue for you? Yeah, there's a lot of things in science, frustrating, many things. It's a part of this globalization. You know, science is globalizing, it's becoming global. But then you lose your identity. And that's a dangerous thing. So, you know, I, but we are trained as classical scientists. So, you know, it's a, if you are a musician, you know what does it mean? You are, that it's different when you are in a band and, or if you are alone. In a band, you have to collaborate, but it's different when you are in a small band with four musicians performing, that's still okay. This is more or less when you have small group of collaborators in science, three, four guys, you work together, you share your ideas, you publish papers, right? So the same is in, in, in small bands. But once you join these giant collaborations with a few hundred people, then you are lost. So your contribution is lost. Yeah, everything. Still, I mean, there, there are people who are happy with this, there are people who enjoy and they get involved there, but not me. I always wanted to know what exactly I am doing, what is my job here, what I can do for my ideas, I will fight for my ideas, I will lose, I will win, but it will be me. It will not be 500 people plus me. <laughs> you know what I say? So it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a character, it's, it's a, my character, it's simply, it's not good, not bad, but it's me. <laughs> So you led the team, which found the first observational evidence that supernova explosions are responsible for the formation of stellar mass black holes. In layman's terms, what does that mean? Well, that means that, uh, so we had a, exactly, we had a, we had a collaboration. And in fact, our goal, initial goal, was not to find this evidence, but we were looking for a completely different thing, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> so the, the whole idea of this collaboration, we were looking for totally different things. And then suddenly I discovered this, which was much more important than what we were looking for. <laughs> that's, that's funny. So those things happen in science. So we were looking for, I mean, it's a bit complicated to, to, to explain, but anyway, the stars that, uh, that, so the black holes are usually in systems with a star and a black hole. So the star is revolving around the black hole, right? And in those systems, you have uh, flares, like in the sun, you have extremely powerful flares in X-rays, X-ray and UV. So those flares are uh, responsible for uh, generating certain chemical elements. And we were looking for one of those elements, which is called lithium, you know, lithium batteries, right? Mm -hmm. From lithium batteries. So lithium, we discovered lithium in one of the stars, which is going around the black hole. And we, were, we wanted to check what is the origin of lithium in that star. And we were looking for lithium. But, but then we discovered a completely different thing. So basically I was examining the spectrum and I discovered not just lithium, and I didn't care about lithium. I discovered it bunch of elements more interesting than lithium, which is oxygen, silicium, and sulfur. So those elements are like 10 times more abundant than in the sun. So this is striking. So I couldn't believe when I was watching this, I said, Jesus Christ, what's happening there? This must be crazy. The star had 10 times more uh, uh, oxygen than a normal star would have, like our sun, right? So then I went for you know, so what is the matter, what happened, why, blah, blah, blah. So then it led us to this idea that, okay, well, let me actually do this idea that there was a supernova explosion and that supernova has produced all these chemical elements and they were, they were accreted, they were actually captured by the star, by the stellar atmosphere, and we see them now. And then supernova led to the formation of a black hole, which we see now also. So there's a black hole, but if there would have been no supernova, there was no way to explain the presence of these chemical elements in the star. So the only way, the only way, the only way you can imagine of having so much oxygen and silicium and sulfur in the atmosphere of the star is if there was a supernova explosion, which has polluted the star. And since we now have a black hole sitting in the system, 
the conclusion was straightforward. There was a supernova and that has produced the black hole. Because today we observe more than 20 black holes in our galaxy. We have evidence of more than 20 stellar mass black holes. But we don't know how they were formed because we don't see any remnants, nothing. We see the black hole and the star going around. We have no idea how the black holes have formed. So that was the first and the only case when we clearly see there was a supernova explosion and now there is a black hole sitting in the system. So it's a very interesting discovery. But as a matter of fact, we were looking for a completely different thing. <laughs> we were looking for lithium and then we discovered the, the oxygen thing. But those things happen a lot in science, they, they happen. So you look for something else and then you discover a completely different thing. That's, that's a fun, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really exciting. And this is when you, you don't sleep for months. Literally, you don't sleep because it's everything is in your head and it's boiling and you are calculating, you are comparing, you want to make sure, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to write a paper. You have to fight with the referees and the referees will come up with their arguments that are to kill your idea. You have to defend yourself. And, then, and that goes another six months until you convince everyone and then you publish your paper. <laughs> so, but it's very nice, it's very entertaining. <laughs> Do you feel like your discoveries have made you more of an optimist or pessimist in life? I think optimist, optimist, definitely optimist. Yeah, you have to be optimist. I think you have a choice in life. You have a choice. You can be optimist or you can be pessimist. It's up to you to choose. <laughs> It's better to, and it's safer, it's more healthy to choose optimism. <laughs> I agree. Well, it's interesting, right? Because even with the re recent James Webb images, a lot of people are like, God, we're just a little tiny speck, you know? And there could be yeah. that pessimistic view where you're like, oh, I'm just, I'm a nothing. I don't really mean anything in this universe. But there's also, I think, the optimistic side, which is there is just so much we don't know. There is so little we do know, or we exactly. think we know. So it yeah. really kind of leaves endless possibilities for great things too, I think. So that's the optimist in me. Exactly. I, I think the, the feeling from when you, when, you, when you observe those images, when you study those images, of course, I mean, you get a feeling that, yeah, we are nothing. We are just a piece of just a small dust particle in Sahara Desert, but nothing. But then they also transmit you a feeling that the universe and the world and nature are so amazing, so interesting. And you have a chance to study this. Has it and you have a unique chance to study why the universe is so big, what is happening in the universe, and not just the universe. You can study neuroscience, you can study human brain, which is a different universe. It's a universe inside of a universe. You can study AI, you can study biochemistry. So the science is so amazing. Whatever you touch is infinite. And so that's why you say, yeah, of course the universe is big, but I have a chance to study this and discover something which no one knows and maybe answer some questions. And it's more or less the same as arts and arts is, it's, it's very similar, you know. There you, you, you explore with your heart the feelings. is a different universe. And there you go with your brain. Your mind is exploring. It's, it's, it's so interesting. But I think it's creative work is what is more interesting. Anything creative. Is, you have to do creative work. If you are a creative person, yeah. then agree. your world is different. You I live agree. in a different world. It can be anything creative. It can be your work, uh, Sonajan. It's a very creative work because you are exploring how to question, how to, how to, uh, how to approach if, if any single, any of your interviewers, any of your guests. You have to study them. You have to approach them. You have to make right questions. It's a creative work. Yeah, and, and everything stems from the curiosity. If you naturally have curiosity to understand and to learn. Absolutely, absolutely. If in any profession, you have to look for a creative part. There yeah. is a creative component everywhere in every single profession. So in agriculture, 
in uh, in everything so, you know if, if you are a creative person you approach your job your work from creative perspectives you know from that yeah. point of view and it's a different world totally and for you it was so organic to combine art music and science just because of your passions and curiosity in life but it's also yeah. so clever to be able to make science popular for the masses and now you're going to be having this festival and bringing it to Armenia. What does it mean to have something like this in Armenia? Because for me, someone who obviously doesn't understand that much um, about science compared to someone like you, I think it's so important besides having the most brilliant minds in Armenia, just strategically bringing these people to Armenia, it's also for innovations. I think it's so important to really bring a focus of science to Armenia. But what does it mean for you to have a festival like this there? Yeah, I mean, of course, for me, it's very important to bring my child, my my festival to Armenia. And um, I think I would be very happy if we can uh, create this culture of, uh, of lectures, of going to a lecture, going to hear someone in Armenia. I think 99% of our population in Armenia, in most of the countries in the world, they go to hear someone in, um, if there is, a, if there is, if there, if there is a demonstration or if there is a manifestation of the, you know, the revolution, then they go to hear the politicians or the guys complaining from the country and so on. But it's different when you go and you hear the most brilliant minds on the planet telling you about your brain, telling you about genetic engineering, telling you about space and everything. So that's a culture. So you, you need to learn you get, have to get used to this. What does it mean you go to the lecture? So it's very different. So, so people lose this feeling after they graduate universities. So at universities, you are at the lecture to study something for your exams. But it's totally different when you have a public lecture by a super famous scientist or maybe an artist, or maybe an artist. Imagine a, a, a famous filmmaker giving a 45 minute lecture about his, his films or something super interesting, right? So we don't have this culture in Armenia. People think that they have to go to venues only for sport events and for music, nothing else. So the world is consists of sports and, and music. Then you go to places like Kamalir and so on. But that's not the case in many European countries. And first of all, in the UK and also in US. There are top science communicators. So people are not aware that one of them, like Brian Cox in, in, in London, in UK, he was lecturing for 15,000 people in arenas. And he's made a tour in two months. He lectured for 170,000 people. And the tickets were sold out in, in, in two hours. And these were lectures about the origin of the universe, about black holes. So how, you can imagine that 15,000 people are going to hear someone talking about the universe. This is very strong. It's very interesting. The same happens in US when Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, goes to, to give, gives lectures in large arenas, filling in 10,000 people, 15,000 people. That's, that's great, amazing. If we can, if we can, make sure that there are at least one or 2,000 people in Armenia interested in public lectures. That's already something. <laughs> and I think it's amazing for diasporans to be able to fly to Armenia at that time and to be able to participate. I, one of my best friends, she just bought a ticket. She's coming to the festival and I am yeah. trying everything in my power to be in Armenia at that time too, because I think this is mind blowing. I think it'll be so fun to take part. Yeah, so, Rajan, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity because you will never have a chance, never again in one week to have so many brilliant minds in one place, in the same city, in the same venue, giving lectures about the most interesting things in the world. That never happens. This only Starmus does those things. Only our festival. 
There is no second science festival in the world. I cannot name a second science festival in the world which does things even close to Starness, even close. We are the only ones who bring the most brilliant minds every two years to one single city. And which is very tough actually to do. It's not easy at all, not easy. But somehow we manage, we have this gravity. We, we know how to do it. We know the chemistry, we know the formula. We've yeah. tried first time and then it worked. It means that we were in the right direction and we have amazing advisory board. We have musicians, we have Peter Gabriel and Brian May in our advisory board. We have brilliant scientists, Nobel laureates. So we have all tools and we have all uh, machinery. <laughs> we, have, we have all the no we have the knowledge how to do that. And the first time we are doing this in Armenia, not only in Armenia, in all this region, I mean, countries like Turkey, Iran, or Georgia, in all this area, they've never seen science festivals. Science festivals are very much European and US uh, culture. Mm -hmm. Australia, Australia. So these are the countries which, which are very, uh, they, they, they know what is a science festival. So the first time we are bringing science festival to Armenia and we hope to, to create some interest in Armenia. <laughs> of course. How are you able to initially make this kind of a mainstream thing? How are you able to make that first mainstream connection? Yeah, it's a good question. I, <laughs> I don't know how we do it. <laughs> I guess because we choose very interesting topics. Yeah, first for lectures. Now, obviously, we have a filter. We go for the top of the top, right? We go for the top. Of, and also the topics. Yeah, so, so we have to astronomy. The secret is in astronomy, actually. Once we get astronomy in the center, space and astronomy should be in the center. Imagine like a solar system. The sun is a space and astronomy and the planets are all other sciences. So the planets are neuroscience, biochemistry and, uh, and earth sciences. And uh, because I know that people and mainstream media, they are very interested in space, in science. So once we get the space, we make sure that we have space in the center, mm -hmm. then everything else comes around and the usually most interesting things. And new science is just genetic engineering, which is a new, very young science, but it's getting more and more, more and more important. So if you make sure that you have lectures, for instance, we have a lecture on fusion energy, which is the future of humanity, how we are going to survive energy crisis. So once there is no gas and oil, solar energy is not enough. The only way is to fuse hydrogen, create helium like we have it in the sun. So that we do exactly the same thing as sun does, converting hydrogen to helium. So now we have a project for already 20 years running called ITER and Eurofusion and Tokamak, trying to create fusion reactions. In 20 years, 30 years, if these guys are successful, there'll be no energy problems on the planet. So everything will be sorted. We can shut down all nuclear power stations, all gas, oil, everything we shut down and just one fusion reaction will be enough for an entire planet because that's the most uh, yeah most efficient energy and most clean there's no radioactivity there are no dangerous nutrients nothing it's just a pure energy so that's another example yeah so we, we try to bring most interesting branches of science yeah, yeah. From everything that you've learned, what do you, what would you wish that ordinary people would know that you feel like would maybe change the course of their lives? I would, I think it's just a curiosity. At first, they realize that science is what is going to save the planet or change their life, make our life better. We know it already. So I was always saying that you guys, you use iPhones, you use, you use cell phones every day, but you have no idea that behind these cell phones is actually physics. So if there was no Faraday, there were no <laughs> physicists, you wouldn't have an iPhone. It doesn't come from technology, it comes from physics. 
And it comes from simple curiosity of people in 18th century who are spending their own money to investigate electric currents. <laughs> and that has brought us to, to all these technologies. So I, my, my hope that people start, uh, they, they value science, they respect science, they understand that science is the future. Science is really the future. It makes our life better with electric cars, with everything. The recent news about the launch of Armenia's first state satellite into space was yep. highly politicized. And um, there was a lot of noise around it. A lot of people were saying that, oh, the images are, are high resolution, low resolution. It means something really important for the country. It doesn't mean anything for the country. And you know, a lot of us are just seeking out any kind of positive news coming out of Armenia. And this is something that became really politicized. And then uh, a lot of us just didn't know what to really believe about it. What's the reality of this news for Armenia? And the reality is that the, the satellite, the first Armenian satellite, has uh, as higher than medium, is, is, is actually considered high resolution satellite. So the images have a very good quality. Mm -hmm. The images can be used in agriculture, in mining, and for climate, and lots of things, even for, for military, even for military, because it's two meter resolution. And this satellite has certain characteristics which do not have any other satellite. So you can follow a path of, uh, for instance, if you want to observe a river trajectory, this satellite allows you to do that. While all other satellites, they observe with straight lines. So you have to scan every line and get tons of images before you can see anything which is curved with the shape of something. But this one, you can perfectly follow, uh, follow the trajectory, follow the, for, for instance, follow the river. And you don't need to spend your time observing something which is not in your field of interest, you know? So that's very specific for this satellite. And also, the, but the first most important thing I think for Armenia, well, we'll learn how to process satellite images, how we plan observations with satellite, how we communicate with satellite, how we send data, how we receive data, how we control the satellite. So all this is very new for Armenia. And Armenia has a chance to learn and to get into space technologies. And even more, they can learn how to make satellites, how to make cameras, how to create a software for electronics, and optics and so on. It's, an, it's a branch of, uh, it's a, what we call uh, um, space instrumentation. Yes. Space instrumentation. I know there are many engineers in Armenia in optics and electronics. So for all these people, it's just a new industry. And the space industry is becoming more and more important. And if we can learn how to make business in this world, in the world of space technologies, huge benefit for Armenia. Not only software, but also hardware to, to design, to make things, to design the satellite buses and cameras and all that stuff. So this is just the first step. But it's a very important step. So we have to get involved. <laughs> I've watched so many interviews with you and you've mentioned that the funding isn't really the primary issue in Armenia. Uh, as far as the sciences being able to, um, to really expand. What we need is to have more experts, to not have outdated materials, and to be able to keep the experts in Armenia instead of them having to go to leave to work. So how do we set that foundation? Yeah, it's probably a mostly difficult question. <laughs> we have to make sure that we have to identify the best science and engineering experts in Armenia. This, I, th I don't think it has never ever been done. We don't know where are these people. Mm -hmm. They are hiding in, in, in companies or at home or doing different things, you know? But my point was that if you have, imagine you have billions of dollars for science. Now, if you are pouring a lot of water on the ground, it's a ground, the soil will absorb everything. But if you are pouring this water on asphalt, on, on, on the road, 
it will stay. So you need a soil, you need uh, you need a you need a, you need a, an environment to absorb this money, and that has to come from really highly high professional scientists and labs and so on and so on. So the question is not funding. Actually, the question is if we have all this potential, all this knowledge, and all these specialists to really get all this money. So that's the question. And I think no one really knows the answer. I was always asking, just, you guys, do we have a list of all the scientists? Where do they publish? In which publications? What are the so that all complete information that if tomorrow we have money for this or that, are we sure that the results will be as we, as we expect them, right? And it seems to me that the answer is not trivial. They don't know that still i mean we have to we we have to create we have to investigate before we put a lot of money into the army and science and and engineering and there are many startups and many companies in armenia but again there is no centralized information if you ask them can we build this can we design this can we then oh maybe there is a company oh these guys they can do but we don't know maybe maybe yes maybe not so the, it's, it's all scattered, the information is, is, uh, is not available. Well, probably the Starmus Festival will bring some of those people into one place and hopefully yeah. there will be some networking and something could be born out of that as well. Absolutely. That's what we hope. We have a science camp with boots, with exhibition and, uh, and Armenian universities, Yerevan State University, will an American uh, American University of Armenia will participate. So they will all, we hope to bring all these guys together and, and uh, on the same platform, the same place, and, uh, and perhaps create this, uh, this, uh, this center, the, 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 the trigger this interest and then start everything. Well, we'll see, this is like, I always call this Starmus is an experiment. So we are doing an experiment in Armenia, in yeah. Armenia. Let's see what is the reaction. Obviously, we hear so many positive things from students. First of all, students of physics and sciences, right? But uh, STAMS is not just designed for good students. It's really designed for general public. It's for general public. In fact, most of the participants at STAMS are are lawyers and businessmen and medicine doctors. Very few scientists come to Starmus, very few. Most people are, you know, guys from information technologies and computer science, again, medicine doctors. People are curious about science, they're very interested, and they just come to Starmus. Yeah. The scientists, they keep that, they, I think probably the mentality of um, an average scientist that, yeah, I know everything of that, so I'm not interested. <laughs> you know? So that's probably that's the answer, yeah. But anyway, we are more interested to bring the general public, sciences, the sciences is for general public, exactly. Yeah. Of course. How do you feel that your field has uh, changed the way you feel about life and death? Maybe as opposed to before you started exploring yeah, I think the <laughs> yeah you see a life and death as a natural phenomena as something which is normal. Is a is a is a, is a if even stars die, everything dies in nature. So that's a normal thing. You know, you shouldn't be. Obviously, sci-fi is still exploring possibilities that you can live forever if somehow we can copy everything in your brain in a computer with your feelings, with everything, with your personality. If we have a way, if we know how the brain works, if we can completely map everything, all connections in your brain, all the bio information, and we can copy it somewhere, store it, later restart and restore like you are doing with your laptop, right? The whole operational system, you can restart. So that's the idea. So then, okay, maybe you can live forever. So your brain will be stored and it can be restarted in a different body or you can create artificial bodies and androids or whatever. 
But what is more important is the information in your brain with your feelings, with your memories, with everything that you have can be stored. So that's a very big challenge. And I know that there are people working on this. Very tough, but if they succeed, if one day we succeed, it means that you are really making it forever. You know, you don't die, actually. Your body will die, but your consciousness, your, your, your brain, which is, which is you, it's not your body, it may leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, do you think we just disappear? that people are just yeah the body is just chemicals yes tissues and molecules it will be gone yeah but the only information that you have in your brain which is actually your personality that's what who you are this is in your brain if we have a way if we know how to store this that's a different story and if we don't find a way how to store it do you think that it just dissipates it's just gone or do you yes unfortunately maybe yes probably yeah yeah obviously there's all these stories about radiation that you radiate all the energy goes into space and it never disappears yeah of course i mean no but it doesn't mean that your information organized information your personality doesn't mean that it will stay somewhere in the universe no it's yeah. simply your electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, that's gone. But not what you have in your brain. That's, that's a different story. It will be very hard to keep that. And if, you, if, if someone dies, then this will be gone. I think it will be gone forever. It will just disappear. Unless we know how to save, how to store all that information. What do you think about the fusion of artificial intelligence with humans that's being discussed a lot now? Yeah, that's a very, very, very far. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. For the moment, artificial intelligence is just a software that we are writing. It's our own soft. We are developing it. We are writing. And obviously, we don't, we don't know every single step how but we know the algorithms right so it's not really a human brain it's still very far from a human brain very far first of all there's a strong component of biochemistry in our brain which comes about feelings and love and all those things it's all bio it's all biochemistry and ai is not doing biochemistry ai is not doing biochemistry so Still, there is much, much, much more in the brain than simple AI. I think as always, you know, people like exaggerations. So they exaggerate everything they bring it because the name AI is so attractive. It's so sexy. They say AI and then it goes movies, sci-fi and everything mixed, right? But getting from the AI to real human brain, it's mm-hmm. what I was saying. So if one day we manage to, to know the feelings and complete memory set up with all layers we can recover and everything, then, then you don't need even AI. That's, that's already you have it, you know? <laughs> I, think, I think it was Elon Musk that was saying that he feels it's inevitable to eventually have that, <clears throat> excuse me, to eventually have that fusion. Do you think it's inevitable and do you think it's dangerous perhaps? Well, it's very tough. I don't know. We, we will need a separate program to discuss this. <laughs> it's very it's very long discussion. Yeah. It's very hard to say, you know, it's you can always make this make a guess and say, yeah, it's you know, if we as humanity, if the human race can survive climate change, overpopulation, all these stupid wars. Mm-hmm. You know, because we will end up probably much, much, much before we will get to the point of AI combining things. You know, this is the most optimistic view that we, 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 we can solve everything else and then get to the point when science is so, so, so advanced that we end those things, right? I wish we are there. I wish Elon is right. And then we will see that in 10, in thousand years, 10,000 years. So which means humanity will survive everything, right? The climate change and, and, and all those things. Yeah, if that's the case, yeah, let's be optimistic. 
maybe but but first we have to sort out problems on, on a planet from political point of view the mess that we are creating on a planet just from politicians and countries fighting with each other and the complete mess that you see which is which is shame as a humanity you know very simple elementary problems that we cannot solve between countries and between different states bringing to wars look at what is happening in the world right so if, if we can manage, if we can have, get through this, then science definitely will take us very, very, very far, right. very far. You mentioned climate change. There's a lot of talk about doing now climate change lockdowns. What do you think about that? I, 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 I don't know because I haven't seen numbers. I don't know what would be the effect of those things on a global climate change. We should see it. I haven't seen numbers, but uh, but um, it's much more serious. It can be that there's a serious natural component in a climate change, which is not very much dependent on on industries on anything. That this is just happening. Climate has been changing all the time on the earth. There are several glacier periods. There are no humans, and the climate has been always changing. But now a climate change with eight billion population means a lot with all these technologies which means we have to find a way to survive and to save the population the agriculture and all those things and then again you have science to help so if we have to develop new agriculture and new ways to protect humanity from drastic changes of temperatures then again let's support and let's see what science can do that's the only hope that's the only hope. But instead of fighting and wasting billions and hundreds of billions in weapons, killing each other, we should better focus our energy, money, and efforts in, in thinking about how to make this planet a better place. We know that science can do it. Science has already proven that it can take humans from caves and build cities and, and make cars and planes and make our life better. Life expectancy is already 100 years, not 30 years, like 100 years ago. We have powerful medicine. We can do lots of things. And that's all thanks to science. So I just wish that um, the politicians would become <laughs> a bit wise. And then <laughs> so we'll develop a better system, better system to stop fighting. And <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what do you hope to accomplish in the next 10 years? Me? Yes, you personally. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I have some interesting problems to solve in my, in science for me, in the field of planetary systems and studying stars with extrasolar planets and so on, looking for very interesting things, some science of alien life, alien biology using new tools new computer softwares and new observations better telescopes and so on so that's, that's something coming from there and i also hope to establish starmus as a as a permanent festival based somewhere so probably i think for starmus is good to have a to have a base to have a base city and then travel around the world but still be based somewhere and we, we should look for a place and then and improve maybe a format and so on i i also have to to do some work for starmers to make sure that it's 100 percent stable <laughs> and uh, and of course i will carry on with my music <laughs> with my hobbies yeah. and uh, and i need to spend more time with my friends so that's what i miss a lot so the work takes you so much time and i wish i could meet my friends more often more often a few times a year so my friends again they are all scattered all all around the world mm -hmm. i've got friends in canada i've got friends in us and everywhere, and not much time to meet them and so that's i wish i can do it <laughs> yeah of course you recently visited spacex i heard yeah yes yeah. So tell us a little bit about yeah. that oh that's the most impressive thing <laughs> uh, i was very surprised 
and it was a nice surprise to see so many young people. So the average age was below 30. There was only 26, 25 years old guys working. So it was an environment that you turn your head and you only see young people. It was super nice. That was my first impression. And the second thing I was, uh, and I like that, they had uh, conference halls, big conference halls, meeting rooms, named after very famous rocket scientists. And one of them was Korolev. The first room when you enter this basics on the right side was a room of Korolev on the left side, which is, who is a Soviet, uh, is the father of Soviet uh, rocket science. And then there was a room of Werner von Braun and there was another room. So I, I, I really like this idea that Elon is very, you know, very international, right? So he, he, he's, he's taking care of everything, of every single aspect. And I've heard also people speaking Russian in SpaceX, yeah, people speaking Russian and all languages, as far as I know, there are uh, 70 nationalities working in <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also incredible to see how they are assembling how they building all the rockets, parts of rockets, because they do everything there. So that's the only company which, which, uh, which does everything from zero in their uh, workshops. So, so, so you can actually see all the rockets and engines, everything is assembled in the same place. So that was very impressive, <laughs> very okay. impressive. So what was your reason for the visit there? Well, uh, to visit SpaceX <laughs> and visit and uh, and meeting Elon and uh, and uh, that was a couple of years ago. It was uh, maybe four or three years ago before COVID. Yeah. Uh, last time I just went to JFK to to uh, the, the Kennedy Space Flight Center to see the launch of Falcon Nine. Mm. That was a few months ago, and it was again incredible. I've never seen this before, yeah. so I was very much looking forward to see the launch of, uh, of a rocket. It was one of the most impressive things I've seen in my life. So it's highly recommended to go and see it from Florida. Yeah, <laughs> incredible. And then yeah. can you tell us about your exploration of alien life? My exploration of alien life, you know, as an astronomer, I'm using uh, the tools that I know very well. So I work with spectroscopy, and I'm trying to use spectral tools to, to detect certain signatures in spectra of stars or extrasolar planets that could indicate the presence of biological life or maybe intelligent life, or perhaps even intelligent life. But has, um, yeah, that will come next couple of years as uh, now with James Webb, we will have more data, much more data. And the new European telescope, which will be inaugurated in 2024, in actually in, in two years, three years, is about 40 meter giant telescope. We are going to have the best, best uh, instruments, spectroscopy for spectroscopy on this telescope. And with that, we can do so many things. I just hope that <laughs> I always, I'm very jealous for those, for young PhD students who are starting their career now, and they will be using all these tools. They will have so much data, so incredible quality, and they will have really powerful softwares and computers with AI and so on to study those things. They have much, much more possibilities than my generation, which is normal, I mean, Everything evolves and everything is, uh, yeah, but we already know it. We see it. I know that this is happening. And I really hope that Armenia will join this big science uh, market. Armenia has to join because we had traditions in Armenia. We had amazing scientists. We had very good uh, engineers. And we lost like 30 years in our history last 30 years and i hope very much that we will return to this to the science and technology era 
very soon, very soon. We have to do it because the interest and curiosity is there. Mm -hmm. So many talented, so many incredibly uh, clever guys, girls in Armenia. Mm -hmm. We should give them an opportunity to study at best universities and create those universities in Armenia too. That's and I true. hope Starmus will help. I hope Starmus will help a lot. Yeah, I'm sure it will. I know it's going to be so inspiring. Even people who just come to for the arts and for the music, I think will actually discover a new passion for science. And I think that's what's so clever about what that's exactly. Yeah, you are trying to drag more and more people, bringing yeah. popular musicians and so on, and even paying attention. Imagine if someone knows. Uh, someone is following Serge Tankian, for example, and Serge says, I'm going to Starms Festival. So usually they think, okay, Starms is one of music festivals. So these guys, they join. And then you look at this and say, this, is, this doesn't look as a music festival. What the hell is this? <laughs> and then you look at the names. So Jesus, this got Nobel laureates and astronauts. What the Serge Tankian is doing? <laughs> you know, this yeah. is very this is very clever you know this is very nice and this is how I, yeah. we bring people to Starmus through Brian to Serge and so on that's uh, very very clever absolutely absolutely and I'm telling you one of the one of the reasons that I started this show in the first place is because when I would notice people strategically bringing attention to something that otherwise wouldn't really get as much mainstream attention I start paying attention to the steps that they take because I think it's so important and I think for uh, Armenians in the diaspora as well as Armenians in Armenia who watch these episodes it's so interesting I think for, to be able to have the chance to learn from someone that you look up to that it was actually really thought out what they did and how they did it and then they can learn how to take those steps themselves to do that in their respective fields Absolutely. so I think yeah. it's it's really awesome. You took your kind of organic journey that happened with a fusion of just your personal interests in art and music and science, and you actually created a structure that you get to bring to Armenia and use that to teach people. Because one of the most, I think, problematic things anywhere in the world is when you have a teacher that doesn't really kind of inspire that interest no. in you. And that's why it's it's interesting that you said that you didn't show up to the lectures. I mean, yeah. you can't be forced to be interested in something or passionate exactly. about something. Yeah. yeah. And so now I you're mean, finding a way to really bring this incredible thing and actually yeah. inspire interest and curiosity in people. So that's awesome. Absolutely, yeah. The three types of teachers ones who inspire the ones who don't care and the third ones who kill your inspiration yeah. <laughs> exactly. the three types the exactly. ones who are neutral who just don't care and the ones who can actually kill talented kids and can kill also interest and so that's even worse and there are teachers like that there are many teachers like that unfortunately yeah unfortunately yeah, yeah everywhere so perhaps, I don't know, new world with new technologies, with new approach, they have to change that as well. The, the, the way that teachers go to school and, and the education and maybe, so I was always curious as I was saying, why we cannot record the, le the, the lectures, the class? I want to make a video and see how these teachers work. Yeah. You know, so if I'm a, committee member i'm in a commission for for uh, for classifying teachers and for for encouraging or forever i would go and just randomly record classes you know just, i want to know what is happening there because i can't leave 25 kids 300 days with a teacher who's not good who's actually doing a damage that's very 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 bad so yeah. why we don't have these tough measures? You can have cameras in banks and everywhere, but we could probably, the most important things is to check the quality of teachers. You know, this, I don't know any other way to do that. Maybe there are better ways 
obviously this is confidentiality and all this stuff will come over and say, no, you can't do these, blah, blah, blah. All right, yeah, but we need a way, we need a way to make sure that we have the best teachers. They should be well paid, of course, the whole system, I understand that. But anyway, that's the so important, so critical thing. Mm -hmm. And they can over, always argue, no, you can't do it because there are hundreds of millions of kids that's not an excuse. Even for hundreds of millions of kids, you need to make sure that they get a good education and they should be inspired. Yeah. That's more to do with the system, you know? And with, Why you have, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say with Armenia, it's a little bit easier because we don't have hundreds of millions of kids in Armenia. So that's okay. definitely something that's doable in our country. Why you have YouTubers science youtubers young guys explaining physics in the most amazing way have millions of followers in youtube young guys i was astonished you look at these kids and you say they are so passionate and they do this in youtube so uh, thousands of teachers cannot do even one percent of that so and these guys they don't have any 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 uh, pedagogical education they didn't study at the university to become teacher yeah it's just the passion and the curiosity just the passion and they do it very well yeah yeah no absolutely it's a very good point but i think you're setting the foundation now to spark that curiosity and to spark that passion and then when there's a demand for it because there's so much so much of the curiosity and so much of the passion then hopefully it will start attracting the right people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Done. Thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And um, I hope we'll get to do it in person soon. And yeah, I'm right. very, very, very excited about Starmus. <laughs> I can't wait to come. Thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to see you, Sanajan, and Starmus in Armenia Thank with you. your family. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanajan. <laughs>